pleased to be able to introduce Amy Collier um, as our um, uh, final presentation for today. Amy is the Associate Provost for Digital Learning at Middlebury College, where she provides strategic vision and leadership um, at Middlebury. And I'm going to let her introduce herself further and um, come and talk to us about critical digital fluency. Thanks, Amy, for joining us. Thank you. Can everyone hear me OK? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I know I'm the last presentation of the day, so hang in there. We'll get through it. Um, so one year ago, almost to the day, um, I was asked to give a talk at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland um, about the topic, Critical Pedagogy in Troubled Political Times. It was just as the new presidential administration was taking its place, and uh, they wanted a US perspective on what we thought might happen in higher education as a result of some of the changes we were seeing, both kind of at the political level, but then also as a, as a society as, uh, as at the, in the US. So during that presentation, which was one of the hardest presentations I've ever given in my life, by the way, um, I used this slide. And I said, under Trump, higher education, or education, uh, will become the site of overt struggles over civil and human rights. We were already seeing this trend start to happen. Uh, things like professor watch lists were coming online that uh, targeted harassment towards professors who did particular kinds or who taught particular kinds of discipline like women's studies and African American history and other uh, topics that were deemed kind of um, uh, not valid. Um, we were seeing, uh, we were already seeing uh, immigration officials start to knock on our campus doors and ask us about the immigration status of our students. DACA was already beginning to be in threat. Um, the changes to Title IX provisions that protect students from uh, sexual harassment and sexual assault, that those, were, those changes were already starting to be inked. So it felt like a moment where things were feeling kind of bleak and becoming bleaker by the day. Now, little did I know that two days after I got home from the University of Edinburgh, on my own campus, we were going to experience this exact thing. And what we later started to call the March 2nd event, when Charles Murray came to Middlebury, we saw this flare up on our very own campus, a struggle over civil and human rights at our own campus. Now, I'm not going to, yeah, I know pointing to that event might give you a, a reason to think that I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about my perspective on that whole thing and what happened. We're not going to go there. What I wanted to point to instead was that that event and the way in which it's flared up into our campus life and our courses has represented, I think, bears the hallmarks of greater things happening in our in our society right now. The erosion of trust, the influx of polarizing voices, and generally just a mistrust or a uh, devaluing of public institutions and their role in the public sphere. So all of that was captured not only in the idea that we were about to see these things happen in education, but in the fact that it was happening on my own campus. So this is the context in which I would like for us to think or reframe our work uh, with the goal of making positive change. Now, I don't think we really have a choice. I think education is not apolitical. I think it's something that we have to take a stance in. In education, and as instructional designers and educators and technologists, we have the opportunity to come to the table and influence what happens. And what I would like to do today is invite you to that table with me, or if you're already there, to welcome you and thank you for being there. What we're going to talk about today is how that all relates to the notion of critical digital fluency, which is a term that we're using a lot at Middlebury right now. As Jesse said, well, Jesse and I have something in common, which is we like to use Jesse's tweets in our presentations. <laughs> I don't think we can miss this moment. This is one of those moments in education 
where we can no longer afford to bullshit our way through it. And not saying that we ever had, but if there was ever a moment to pay attention to what we're doing and to rethink it, I think this is it. Now, I know you might be thinking, okay, Amy, you, were, you said you were gonna talk about critical digital fluency. Uh, and I did actually put it in my title and on my first slide and all that good stuff. Um, you might be wondering how critical digital fluency ties into what I just described, the political and social moment that we are experiencing in this country and in the world. And when we see articles like this, highlighting the intentional disinformation and polarization within our digital spaces, and how that starts to seep into the everyday lives that we experience and our students experience, I think that connection becomes clearer. There are concerted efforts to polarize us in digital spaces. There are concerted efforts to silence voices through targeted harassment, through manipulation. And those all impact us. We could talk about this all day. I'm sure every day you see a new article or something passed through on your feed that says that this is a space that is becoming increasingly toxic and polluted. And these are the spaces where education is intersecting. We want to think of the, of the web as a public sphere. How many of you have heard the term public sphere used in reference to the web? Yeah. And it, certainly there have been indications that certain kinds of public sphere-like activities, the kind of discourse and dialogue and connection of diverse voices that can come together and start, start talking about change, societal change, certainly we've seen evidence that that can happen through digital spaces, digital tools and platforms. But we also have to be aware of the intentional issues or the intentionally driven issues that we are facing when we try to treat the web as a public sphere. And Jesse talked about those, some of those things in his talk when he talked about some of, the, some of the ways in which asking students to participate on the open web is a dangerous thing for them. And can we ever truly participate in the public sphere of the web when it's run by private platforms? So in his book called Becoming Digital Toward a Post-Internet Society, Vincent Mosco writes, that we're seeing an increasingly integrated system of network spaces and tools that is accelerating the decline of a democratic, decentralized, and open source internet. And he adds, there's nothing inevitable to this outcome. The next internet can be a tool to expand democracy, empower people worldwide, provide for more of life's necessities, and advance social equality. But instead, it is primarily used to enlarge the commodification and mil militarization of the world. This trend is not inevitable, but concerted political and policy interventions are needed. And I would say intentional educational interventions are also needed. That these are things that can make their way into our educational conversations as instructional designers, as instructional technologists, as educators, you have the opportunity to help move these conversations to a different place. We don't have to accept the digital world the way it is. We can no longer ignore the problems of low digital fluency. We can no longer ignore the fact that many of us, including myself, have been teaching digital fluency for years and not seeing the kinds of results that we would hope to see. And wondering what that's about and how to address it. But rather than a sense of hopelessness and mistrust, which is what I typically feel when I start talking about this. Anyone else feel that way sometimes? Or when you open the, the news? What I'd like to do is to think about critical digital fluency rather than as a way to think about how terrible things are as a way to start to think about how we can have agency, how we and our students can have agency, how we and our students can bring change, how we can start to trust and hope again, and let that hope guide us to a better world, a better digital world, a better society, a better globe. Paulo Freire had a collection of uh, letters 
uh, published after he passed away, his, uh, his wife, his widow, published a set of letters called uh, Pedagogy of Indignation. And in one of those letters, he wrote about the idea of education as practice of freedom. And he said, all liberating practice, which values the exercise of will, of decision, of resistance, of choice, the role of emotions, of feelings, of desires, of limits, the importance of historic awareness, of an ethical human presence in the world, and an understanding of history as possibility rather than as determination is substantively hopeful and therefore, and for this reason, produces hope. I want to argue and, and believe that critical digital fluency and our work towards developing it with our students can be a hopeful act, can be an act of helping to bring into the world what we hope to see. This is what I think Paulo Freire means when he says that education is an act of freedom and this is what I hope critical digital fluency can mean to us. Now, how do we do that, though? I'd like to say that we must rethink what we're teaching. The time we have with our students is precious. Every single time we have to interact with them is precious. I think we would be remiss to not think of critical digital fluency as having a role to play in the work that we do. Or to think of critical digital fluency as something that gets developed outside of the curriculum. That it happens co-curricularly or in other spaces besides our classes. It's certainly been the case that for me and for the people who work with me at Middlebury, at the Office of Digital Learning Inquiry, and the faculty that we work with, it's been a challenge for us to think about how critical digital fluency might fit into the work that we do or to the courses that we teach. But it's been also a really interesting challenge because we all know that the fields that we teach in or that we study intersect with the digital world in really interesting ways. And when we start to think about bringing that into the class, we can see some really interesting things happen. So for instance, I'm teaching a course right now uh, called Intercultural Rhetoric. I'm co-teaching it with a couple of faculty um, across the, uh, different parts of the institution. Um, and as a teaching team, we recognize that rhetoric is happening in digital spaces, right? And so as part of what we're doing in this class to teach students, yes, the age-old traditions of rhetoric, which we know are very, very, you know, have, have been around for a very, very long time, but that, that rhetoric does intersect with the current digital moment. And we're having students look at that and say, what does rhetoric look like in digital spaces? How does it play out? What does it seek to do? Who is it seeking to persuade? And what role do platforms, these digital platforms where we do digital rhetoric, where do the, how do those play in uh, to, to the conversation about rhetoric? And what is the public sphere and how does it play out in digital spaces? So just last Monday, we did a little activity that I loved. It was crazy, but what we did is we looked at memes. Everyone know what a meme is? <laughs> Those, exactly. <laughs> Mimetically shared, viral might be another way to say it, persuasive elements. These are rhetorical elements that are used in digital spaces constantly. And before they did this assignment, I asked the students to evaluate a, a, a community online, to go into a community and just look at it and say, what, what do these people do in this community? And how does it represent things like interculturality and rhetoric, which are the two primary topics of the course? And then we talked about memes, and we talked about, we actually both gave them some tools to deconstruct the memes, and I'll, I'll give you a little of that tool set here in a minute, um, but things like reverse Google image search, right? Snopes, access, you know, just their ability to kind of take these things that they probably see every day in their social spaces and start to deconstruct them and then start to think about them rhetorically and start to think about them from the perspective of how these things get used in the communities where they're used. It was a fascinating conversation. Oh, hang on. I wasn't done with that. I also, you know, so you might be saying, well, okay, that works great for rhetoric, sure. But, you know, maybe I, I teach something that doesn't really fit with, with the digital world. 
And so, you know, maybe this isn't, you know, my class might not be the, the greatest place uh, for this kind of learning. I would encourage you to just take some reflection time to think through whether or not there might be some opportunities within your discipline. So for instance, very recently I had a conversation with a professor who teaches mathematics and quantitative reasoning. And we talked about the ways in which maybe by studying algorithms, students could both start to understand better some of the principles that she's teaching in her quantitative reasoning program, but then also start to deconstruct what they see and better understand that a lot of what they see on the web is algorithmically determined. Or read books like Weapons of Math Destruction that have a lot of information about how algorithms are playing out in our social systems. I recently talked to a professor in environmental studies about the fact that in environmental studies, as you might know, there is tons of misinformation and disinformation being spread on the web about climate science, about oceans. And so we talked about using, bringing in perspectives that show how misinformation, disinformation about the environment is being spread, and then help them, help students engage with the communities of professionals in those fields that are trying to address it. So for instance, there's a group of climate scientists who go around the web finding misinformation and annotating it with hypothesis. And then showing students how that is a way in which the discipline that they're studying is, is taking to heart the role that the digital, the digital platforms are playing in their, in their worlds. I recently had the opportunity to speak in a class on big data a sociology class, a sociology anthropology class on big data, and we talked about prejudicial data practices like digital redlining. I'm about to go speak next month in a class on journalism to talk to them about polarizing uh, rhetoric in journalism and how, that's, how bots and sock puppets, which are my new favorite thing to talk about, um, how those influence journalism and how information gets shared um, uh, on the web. And we're having uh, our translation and localization management students, students who are learning how to translate information from one language to another. We're having them go out on the web of the language they're studying and find memes and, and explore how misinformation is spreading in Spain or in Brazil or in China even. So there are ways in which these projects both bring in a sense of critical digital fluency and they still connect very much to the topic of study. I was, uh, I, one other example, just to, uh, I was talking to a student, I'm working with a student right now who is amazing, um, and she and I are looking at Pinterest. If you ever wanna see something super scary, start to find out about the way misinformation and disinformation spreads on Pinterest, it's kind of crazy. And then you start to think about who the primary audience for Pinterest is, there's a really interesting connection there that we're starting to make. But we start talking about how evolutionary biology um, or ev evolutionary theories, misinformation about evolution is being spread on Pinterest like crazy. And the student said, wow, I just took an evolutionary biology class last semester. My professor would have loved to have talked about this. This is right up her alley. There are so many potential intersections of these fields. With, the, with critical digital fluency. I think if we ignore these opportunities, we run the risk of maintaining the status quo, of accepting that the web is just what it is, and it's, it's toxic and gross, and there's nothing we can do to change it. And I wonder if maybe by engaging with these critically through our disciplinary lenses, we can start to change that perspective. Can you say briefly who the primary audience of Pinterest is and how the misinformation is spread? Sure. So, um, well, I can say a very little bit. Um, so there is a so Pew puts out a research report uh, that talks. It takes the kind of top social media platforms and breaks down their audience. So it is primarily a female social media platform, uh, female used uh, social media platform. Uh, it has a higher percentage of. Uh, conservative users than liberal users. It has um, a pretty high percentage of college educated women using it. So it has some kind of, it, it's different than other social media 
platforms in some in those categories. Um, now, information spreading, misinformation spreading on it, it you know many of us use it for things like recipes and exercises or you know whatever you know you kind of think this is totally innocuous. There's nothing wrong here. You can very quickly get to misinformation through um, essentially the algorithm on, that presents you with a front page, and then once you click on something, it shows you pins that are like this. Um, and very quickly, you can get from exploring preventative measures of cancer or ca uh, for cancer treatment all the way to um, the FDA is, is, is ignoring the uh, tried and true cancer research, right? You can get to conspiracy theory in about two clicks. Um, so Mike Caulfield, who I'll talk about in a little bit, has done a video about this. And then I recently wrote a, a blog post about how misinformation is spreading very quickly on Pinterest. Uh, interestingly, the, uh, you know, after the election, there was a lot of focus on Facebook and the misinformation that was spreading on Facebook. Um, less attention to Pinterest, but I would say almost as much. I mean, maybe not to the scale of Facebook because Pinterest has fewer users, but um, tons of misinformation being spread on Pinterest. It's very interesting. I'm going to come back to Pinterest in a minute, too. There's more there. Any other questions? Well, I stopped. Okay. Um, you know, we have to recognize that engaging with uh, digital spaces critically with our students means that we ourselves probably have to do that in our own lives, right? That to engage these spaces with our students means that you know we have to also be engaging in that way, um, and. I take that as a challenge at my institution to make sure that I'm talking to faculty and students all the time about the issues of digital spaces and some of the things that um, are being, that are both positive and maybe a little more negative about it. One of the things that my, my new group did, so I have a, a brand new group that started in, in January, and right off the bat we said, you know, what can we do to start changing the conversation on our campus about digital, the digital world? Um, and so one of our instructional designers had the great idea of running a digital detox series. And most of the time when we think about digital detoxes, we think about kind of um, how to meditate and how to be mindful when you go online and that kind of stuff. And that's all good. That's all fine. Um, but we wanted to take a, a slightly more critical approach and kind of model uh, the perspective that we were hoping faculty, students, and staff would start to have. And so um, the critical sorry, the digital detox that we ran had things like how to use privacy-oriented web tools, um, safer social media practices, things like deleting old stuff, right, so that it's no longer crawled by algorithms. Um, we started talking about net neutrality. We had a, a, an addition. These are newsletters. So we had an addition on um, net neutrality and its impact on education. So through a series of eight plus one, we had a bonus, so nine newsletters, we were able to help kind of shape conversations about the digital in our lives and then hopefully you know, bring that to education in various ways as well, bring it to the classroom. We had, after we sent out the email that had an invitation to this, um, we had about 150 signups. Uh, most of those staff on our campus, but we had a lot of faculty and a, a much bigger number of students than we really realized would sign up for it. So I think people were really yearning for the opportunity to think a little differently about their engagement in these digital spaces. So that's been really fun. And that's what it looked like. So. One of the things that can happen when you start going down the path of critical digital fluency is that you can start to not trust anything, right? You start to look at everything on the web as potentially fake and potentially problematic and not worthy of your trust. And certainly students feel that way too. We've seen examples of students who, as they start to evaluate things on, on the web, they really just stop believing anything is really real that everybody has an agenda and an intention of, of deceit, and therefore, you know, you can't trust anything. So you remember that uh, Seattle, C and you know, what, what ends up happening, I should, you know, say, one of the issues with losing trust is that it becomes a foundation for cynicism, right? You, you no longer can trust anything, then there's no reason, one, to hope in anything, but you become cynical of, of everything around you. you. You're both easily swayed, swayed and also completely mistrustful. 
Mm -hmm. The mistrustful part, in part, might come from not having a strong sense of self. Yeah. And instead, using the internet as a way of harvesting a profile or creating a persona. Yeah. And I think that in a lot of the issues that we have, it's the sense of self-awareness and consciousness as an individual that should drive what we do, not trying to define ourselves by where we go. Hmm. Yeah. And yet at the same, yeah, I, I agree. I think but the one of the issues there is that um, platforms have, have kind of asked us to present that, right? Um, so I'm reminded, uh, you know, the, uh, go back for a second to that meme. So that meme in the middle, has, has anyone ever seen that one before? Okay, so what's that? Photoshopped. Yes, it is photoshopped. Um, so this meme popped up right after, um, back in the fall, uh, the Seattle Seahawks made the decision in kind of the brouhaha about uh, uh, players kneeling for the anthem. Um, the Seattle Seahawks as a team decided as, a, as an act of solidarity to stay in the locker room uh, during the pre-game pre proceedings, and that included the anthem. So this image began circulating saying this is what, essentially implying that this is what the Seattle Seahawks players were doing when they stayed in the locker room that day, burning the flag. It is a faked photo, and you can probably pretty much tell that from looking at it, um, but this had thousands of shares. One of those shares was one of my uncles. This is how I found this post, was on Facebook, one of my uncles shared this. And I did not respond. I was very proud of myself for not responding. Um, but one of my other uncles did. And he said something to the effect of, well, brother, you might check your sources here because this is probably a fake image. And you know, you just might want to be careful about that. And the uncle who originally posted it wrote back and said, I don't care if it's fake. This is how I feel. And I feel like that's one of the biggest issues that we're facing, is that the lack of trust has made it such that we're really willing to give up the notion of trust entirely and just post things that fit with our worldview. And we, we treat false information in the same way that we would treat true information because we no longer believe either really exists. So the notion of rebuilding trust is one I think we can't ignore. It's one especially as a field, or sorry, as, as, as a, as a uh, system, education has worked very hard to develop verification strategies, trust strategies that help make possible for us to know that things are real or not. Right? So we have the ability to kind of help shape what happens here. Mike Caulfield, who I mentioned just a second ago, he's the director of blended and networked learning at uh, Washington State University, Vancouver. And he's doing some really interesting work in this. He talks about how um, students, uh, well, he says, societies without trust come to bad ends. Students are various, of course, um, but what I find with many students is that they are trust misers. They don't want to spend their trust anywhere, and they think things are equally untrustworthy. And somehow, they've been trained to think this way because it make, they think it makes them smarter than the average bear. Right? So I think we have some work to do to help them. I think we've been part of that training to think that, well, if we just don't trust anything, then that, that makes us smarter than the average bear. Now, I'm not proposing gullibility or blind trust, but to start to build into our interactions in digital spaces the ability to create verification processes. Um, and certainly, you know, websites like Snopes and PolitiFact have already started to show how that can happen. Um, those have been really important sites over the last few months. Um, I think we can help students to develop better discernment of what they can trust and what they can't on the web. And again, thinking about it in terms of disciplinary lenses, if students are doing research for, for classes on the web, helping them to be able to discern better what they're saying could be really helpful. Now, most digital platforms aren't really designed for trust, right? They're not really designed. They are kind of designed for a performance of opinion and performance of identity. Um, so, you know, Facebook, when they got called out for um, all the fake news that led up to the election last year and beyond, I mean, 
fake news is um, you know, well on that platform at this point. They started a process of, of verification that basically algorithmically made comments in response to news posts that said things like fake or you know, kind of had some kind of uh, negative twist on what was posted. They algorithmically raised those to the top, which I think, again, further sends the message that you just can't trust anything because every post was getting the top priority comments were things like, oh, that must be fake, or this can't be real, or that's not true, or things like that. Right? So platforms have not been all that successful in helping us create these discernment strategies, and maybe don't really have great motivation to do so, because honestly, our polarization is one of the ways we give attention to these platforms, and our attention is what they can monetize. So they, platforms, we can't really, I don't think we can really expect that platforms are going to help us um, move to a place of trust. But there are tools that can. Um, so this is one of the best, that's kind of light, sorry about that. One of the best resources I've seen come out, in fact, I think it's, it's about to win a Merlot Award. Um, uh, this is webliteracy.pressbooks.com. It's a free open textbook written by Mike Caulfield, um, Web Literacy for Student Fact Checkers. Um, this is, you know, Mike talks a lot about how there are lots and lots of digital literacy, digital fluency, checklists and things, verification strategies, but they often tend to be really long, kind of uh, don't, don't really help students kind of get a sense for a verification strategy. So he, pr he proposes four moves, um, and, he and he tries to make them very quick moves so that you could do it very quickly. So, you know, my uncle could maybe be willing to try it because it's not a huge amount of time, right? Um, so the four moves are check for previous work. So see, you know, if, has this been published somewhere else? Um, and go to that original source. Um, or sorry, check for previous work is go, uh, go see if it's been published anywhere else, see who, what, what other people are saying about it. Then go upstream to the source and see what's happening there. Read laterally, so read across whatever platform is publishing this to see what else are they publishing, what agendas they might have, and then circle back and follow other trails and start to validate those or not. Um, and so these four moves are pretty quick and easy to do and start to give students a, a, a tool set that they can use as they see information on the web and start to want to use it. Um, and you know, going back into our teaching, uh, Mike talks about how you could build this into an information literacy or information fluency activity in your class pretty quickly. Let's just use the Seattle Seahawks example, right? So you could show students that meme, give them a little bit of time to use the four moves to deconstruct it, and then start talking about some of the social elements of that. Why this particular image? Why this particular player? Right? Did it matter that that player was African American or not? Right, and start having conversations about the broader social pieces around those, that meme, and then start to think about with students how they might make changes, right, or how how they might respond in a situation like that. So me, here I was, super proud that I didn't respond to my uncle. That actually might not have been the best course of action. Maybe I could have done something else. I could have increased uh, his digital literacy, right? And so, have, you know, talking with students and helping them to start develop agency around these things, um, I think will be really, really important. And as they do this, as students start to learn how to verify information, how to debunk um, information, and then write responses to things that are, that are founded in research or founded in, in actual truth, um, you know, giving them a chance to publish those things, to write them up, to, to put better information back on the web, not just to kind of look at the information and say, oh, that's not valid, but actually put ba better information back on the web. So he has a project he's been running called Digipo Wiki. Um, so it's a digital polarization project. Um, this is a wiki where students who are working through these things in their classes can publish better responses to questions like, when did we first start kneeling for the anthem? or our, um, why is there a lack of women in the tech industry? And helping to dispel some of the misinformation about those topics through this wiki. And then he also has this Four Moves blog, which is a, a great little starter place to say, 
let's you know, here are some activities that students can do, and again, generally pretty quick activities that students can do to start using these discernment strategies and start trying to understand and building verification into the processes that they have. So Mike's work has really inspired me over the last few years, um, and it's inspired me more recently. We, we have a nascent uh, project at Middlebury uh, that we're calling information environmentalism, which is, again, actually Mike's term. Um, which is the idea of depolluting the environment of the web and being active contributors to depolluting the, the, the web. And um, so he has inspired me and that student I was talking about before to start going onto Pinterest and spreading verified information, right? So if, if misinformation is spreading on the web, can we start to look at that, research and analyze how misinformation is spreading on the web, and then use those same mechanisms to start spreading real, verified information in the same ways. So we're focused on Pinterest because we're just starting to understand a little bit about the financial drivers of Pinterest, the algorithms of Pinterest. So we're focused on that so we can just really understand the platform. But you could do it on any platform, right, to understand how information is spreading and then start to use that platform to spread better information. So what we're doing is uh, taking Digipo Wiki articles, so articles that students have written and that have been verified, and we're designing pins for Pinterest that push that information out on that platform. We're also going to be doing it for Snopes and PolitiFact and other verification sites. And I just was able to start to get the interest of an of a art professor at Middlebury to have her students help us design the art for these pins. So really trying to take in a lot of different perspectives and say, you know, what can we learn about these platforms, how information spreads, how art plays into it, how the design of these pins actually plays into it, and can we use those learnings to start shaping what happens on Pinterest? Um, and so, you know, you can see an example. We've just started playing with this. So uh, the student has created a, um, a, p a pin on whether women are um, bad at interviews or worse at interviews than men. And so if you click that, you can see it takes you to the Digipo Wiki article on that. Mm -hmm. I have a quick comment yeah. on using Pinterest. Uh, I think today, or was it yesterday, if you heard about what happened with Little Thing and Facebook. So Facebook just changed its algorithms so that Little Things, a small startup company, gathered hundreds of thousands mm. of Hmm. by Facebook changing its algorithms. Hmm. So I'm saying, what might you be doing or should you be doing something? Because as Pinterest changed its algorithm, all the posts that you put in will be wiped out. Potentially, yeah. I mean, in, in many ways, this is a research project, right? And so, yes, I, I do hope that we make change, and, and it is a kind of an action research project. Well, and so these are sites of their own, right, that we're just helping okay. to, right, we're, we're connecting to okay. Pinterest, right? Uh -huh. It's a very big kind of news, today or yesterday. Yeah, interesting. Amy, as I'm listening to what you're saying, and what I'm thinking is that truth can be bias-ridden and extremely subjective. Mm -hmm. And so who really is the beholder of truth, and, and how is that? conveyed and convened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so we, we look at sites that have developed, um, whether it's with students or with professionals, uh, a set of orientations towards verifying information, right? So for the Digipo classes, those classes have worked with students to look at, you know, how do we source things appropriately? How do we find the right, the best evidence to support claims or to refute claims, right? Same with something like Snopes or PolitiFact. They have processes, and these processes tend to be uh, more transparent than others about how they're coming to the conclusions that they are. And so I think that's, that's probably a good thing, right? That, that might be as good as we can get in some cases, right? Um, but the idea of, um, pointing to verified information or information that has a well-founded source, set of sources, um, is, is part of that. Yeah. Good. How are we doing on time? Okay. 
The last thing I'll say about what, in my view, critical digital fluency involves is the ability to hold people and platforms and institutions accountable. Um, and primarily here what I'm talking about is platforms, but you know, obviously um, there are people, there are institutions, there are organizations that are intentionally making these spaces more toxic. Um, and so there's work to be done there. But I think it was a real wake up call for many of us who were pretty optimistic, optimistic about the web. We're, we're thinking that um, you know, the web could be that place where social change and social activism could really have a home. Um, when we saw things like the, the protests in Egypt, um, in Tunisia, in Brazil, and other places, and how those, those uh, protests, those movements, um, were able to use the web to unite, to find people who had like views, and to help them find each other, and to push towards social change. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Zainab Tefeki's uh, Twitter and Tear Gas book, which has a lot of this stuff outlined. Um, it was a real wake-up call, I think, to us who, you know, were thinking, yes, this is, this is really exciting that, that the web can do this, to also see last August that those same platforms could just as easily be used to unite um, hate, right? That Facebook was the same platform that the white supremacist hate group used to unite themselves to march in Charlottesville, Virginia. And they were, they were able to use that platform in the same way that the protesters in Egypt were able to. And I think that's, that's one of the ways in which we can, we can start to think about the complexity of what we're talking about here. And how do we hold platforms and people and institutions accountable in times like this? So in the wake of the Charlottesville event, um, John Herman, wrote this really interesting piece that I would recommend uh, checking out, how hate groups force online platforms to reveal their, their true nature. Um, and he had one particular line that has really stuck with me. Um, he said, the, rise, the recent rise of all-encompassing internet platforms promised something unprecedented, unprecedented and invigorating. Venues that unite all manner of actors, politicians, media, lobbyists, citizens, experts, corporations, all under one roof. These companies promise something that no previous vision of the public sphere could offer, real, billion-strong mass participation, a means for affinity groups to find one another and mobilize, gain visibility and influence. This felt and functioned like freedom, but it was always a commercial simulation. And that statement has stayed with me over the last you know, six, seven months since he wrote this. Because I think this is an area where we have to recognize that our, a lot of our connections to the digital world are mediated through platforms. These platforms tend to be privately owned. And I would say <coughs> the same applies for platforms that we use in education, right? The educational platforms we use might be slightly different, but many of them have the same kind of, maybe not the same exact revenue drivers, um, but they have maybe different interests than we do in education. We have, to, we have to look at those things. We have to evaluate those things. Um, when we don't engage critically with the platforms that we use, including the platforms we use in education, we run the risk of continuing to allow these kinds of um, unrepentant platform uh, run, running amok, and, and that, that's a concern. And I think it can even happen in education. So Audrey Waters asks, do our technologies that we use in education, do they serve the interests of social justice, or do they serve the interests of command and control? Do they serve the interests of private interests rather than of our students? I think these are the questions that we have to ask ourselves. And if we aren't, I think now's the time to start. I'm going to skip this one. So recently I wrote an uh, a, a article for Educause Review um, where I started to try to grapple with some of these issues. And actually, this, this article came out of conversations at that Edinburgh trip um, where I started to ask questions about the platforms that we use in our educational institutions and whether or not we're thinking about the ways in which student data intersects with those and how we think about protecting student data and how that might be affected more by the terms of service of the platforms rather than our values for student data. 
And this is particularly important, I think, as we talked about earlier in both Jesse's presentation and this one, where we have students who are at great risk when they hand over their data to us. There is no such thing as safe data for a lot of our students, right? Because when they hand it over to us, they often put their well-being into our hands. Their ability to stay in this country, their ability to be safe from harassment, from violence. When they hand over their data to us, a lot of times they're giving, they're, they're handing us their well-being. And so the question around digital sanctuary is can we start to think of the sanctuary movement which had, which had some values around protecting people uh, who, who needed to be protected and start to apply those principles to how we select educational technologies like learning management systems and plagiarism detection software and other tools that we use on a daily basis, a lot of times maybe without asking these questions. Can we start to think about creating more sanctuary for our students' data as they intersect with these platforms? And in many cases, it might be that we realize that those platforms don't serve the best interests of our students and their data. And we have to figure out institutionally how to, how to reconcile that, how to, how to deal with that. So working on a project right now to help people at institutions look at terms of service for platforms that they typically sign up with and make some kind of crowdsource annotations about those, um, those terms of service so that we can really start to better understand what are we agreeing to when we agree to use these platforms in education and beyond. Um, one of my favorite books that I read last year was a book called We Make the Road by Walking. It's a conversation, it's a spoken book between uh, Miles Horton, who is the, the founder of the Highlander Schools, which if you don't know about, I didn't know about before I read the book. Oh my gosh, amazing, they're still around. Um, and, um, and Paulo Freire, who we mentioned before. And this is one of the um, quotes from the book that I just really loved and I thought made a lot of sense um, as we think about education today and the potential for a critical digital fluency to play a role. Um, he says, there can be no such thing as neutrality. It's code word for the existing system. Neutrality is just following the crowd. Neutrality is just being, is being what the system asks us to be. Neutrality, in other words, is a, an immoral act. It was to me a refusal to oppose injustice or to take sides that are unpopular. It's an excuse, in other words. Now, I know it's hard sometimes to take a stance like this, to kind of say, you know what, when we choose platforms, let's sit down and examine our values and think through what this platform brings and recognize that it's not neutral and that by doing nothing, by not examining our assumptions and the platform's assumptions, that that neutrality might actually be to the detriment of what we're trying to accomplish in education. So, this felt and function like freedom, but it was always a commercial simulation. I think one of the reasons why those, those words hit me so hard is because when I think about education, I think there couldn't be anything that I would feel less about education than these words, right? These words feel hopeless. They feel despairing. They feel different than what we're trying to do in education. So if education is a practice of freedom, what do we need to change? What do we need to be doing? So in those letters that, that I, I referenced that Paulo Freire wrote um, in the Pedagogy of Indignation, he kept using this one phrase over and over again. It's mudar é difícil, mas é possível. Change, changing, is difficult, but it is possible. And he uses it over and over again. And later, in another set of letters to some Brazilian schools, he made an important addendum that I'd like to finish with. He says, Mudar é difícil, mas é possível, e é urgente. Changing is difficult, but it's possible, and it's urgent. So, thank you.
questions for amy yes vicki